Since the beginning, God created humans to be in community. And throughout the Old Testament, God has taught and retaught the people of Israel how to live in community, how to love one another, be accountable to one another, worship with one another. And throughout the prophets, God reminded the people of Israel that God has not forsaken them, even when they are without land and Today's scripture, Jeremiah 29, is really a bomb for the people of Israel who are exiled in Babylon. God says, I know the plans I have in mind for you. They are plans for peace, not disaster, to give you a future filled with hope. And when you search me, yes, search for me with all your heart, you will find me. Now I will be present for you, and I will end your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have scattered you, and I will bring you home after your long exile, declares the Lord. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God's promise of ending captivity and returning the people of Israel from exile were reiterated to the remaining leaders of, his, of Israel, the few from the first generation who were exiled in Babylon. And these remaining few, they're aging and dying. And they are witnessing the next generation acclimate to Babylonian culture, have their own families, and lose the urgency of returning home, and forget the promise that God made them. Yet with these words of hope, God also gives them instructions while they wait. They are not to wait by and by, but settle down, work, have a family, increase in number, engage in the welfare of the city, and Praise the Lord. So these words that Jeremiah spoke were not the hopeful message that the people of Israel wanted to hear. The message seems a little contrary to what God promised, but Jeremiah's insistence on submission to the Babylonian community made him really a traitor in the eyes of the people of Israel. But like the Israelites during this time, church today has been described as being in exile from Christendom. Lee Beach, in his book, The Church in Exile, Living in Hope After Christendom, says exile is not limited to a geographical location, but can be a cultural and spiritual condition as well. He says it's an experience of knowing one is an alien, and perhaps even in a hostile environment where the dominant values run counter to one's own. Feelings of disconnection and loneliness and isolation, misdirection and loss are prevalent. David Congdon, in this article, No, the American Church Isn't in Exile, disagrees. And he points out that thinking of the church as an exile from a particular culture, it further implies that the church has its own. If the church is to embody the exilic identity, then according to Congdon, there are only two options, imperialism or separatism. That either the church conquers the other culture and spreads its culture, or the church separates itself and preserves its own culture. Whether the church today is in exile or not, the church believes as if it is. Asking questions such as, when will God return churches back to the heydays of filled pews, vibrant programming, and children-filled Sunday schools? And as church communities are aging, the first generation of post-Christendom is losing hope they will ever return to those glory days. <clears throat> While the next generation begins to live their own lives, acclimates an ever-growing diverse culture, the urgency of returning to Christendom is waning. And yet, we all struggle to find footing in this post-Christendom place. There aren't many at my church, St. John's, who remember the glory days, the days when membership reached 900. Plenty of programs existed for military families in the Presidio, and the youth group was bustling. And while the symptoms of exile may not stem from a longing of the glory days, St. John's is full of transplants into San Francisco that have little to no family support, and that manifests symptoms of exile. There's loneliness, and hence many people move out of the city within two to five years. And with this constant change in people and demographics, St. John's has to ask itself, how does it address the loneliness people feel, as well as maintain some sense of structure and stability? 
As the technology industry grows, more and more technology companies are building campuses that provide all the needs for their employees. Daycare, meals, lounges, and play areas. There is no need to leave the campus to engage with city life. New transplants, therefore, are not rooted or invested in the life of San Francisco. They don't settle down, build, plant, and engage in the welfare of the city. So with the isolation and separation these campuses foster, how does St. John's and other churches help people recognize the neighbor and engage face-to-face -face interactions in order to increase the connections people may establish with one another? Well, Jeremiah's words of hope to build homes and settle down may give a pathway forward. Gary Galvin, an associate professor of sacred scripture, points out really that Recent scholarship seems to believe that this passage is aimed at the 1.5 generation and not their parents as they are the ones who emigrated as adolescents and would be getting married and building houses. As much as they are in need of hearing messages of hope from God, Jeremiah sees the immigrant as destined by God to make their new home a better place. He says Jeremiah's letter offers a formula of transformation. Hope replaces despair as immigrants can get better jobs and put down roots where they live. Growing up in an immigrant family, the feelings of exile are not unfamiliar. My parents acclimated to American culture very well. And while my family mostly ate Korean food, they never taught me the Korean language and we never adhered to any of the Korean customs. So as a second generation Korean American, I grew up living a very American lifestyle yet yearning to understand my Korean roots as well. Bridging two cultures and weaving through two customs has been a life of exile, never feeling rooted, accepted, or at home. So because I am both in American and Korean cultures, I enter into this lifelong journey of moving from exile from both cultures and yet finding roots in both cultures as well. Well, to better understand my mother, I actually attempted and tried to learn how to cook Korean food. I wanted to know her secrets, her techniques, and her sense of taste. So she once showed me how to make bulgogi, which is this thinly sliced beef marinated in soy sauce and sugar and other flavorful ingredients. And under her guidance, she instructed me on what to put in, how much to put in, and how to do it. I have to say, it was the most frustrating experience I had ever had. My mother's cooking style was not easy to follow. It was not organized. It wasn't premeditated. Everything was based on how she felt in the moment. There were no exact measurements and strategies, just handfuls of this and mixtures of that. And after I mixed in all the ingredients and I pre-mixed in more ingredients, she told me to dip my finger into the marinade and tell her how it tasted. So I put my finger in the marinade, marinade and I tasted it. And I said, it tastes like soy sauce. And so then she put in more ingredients and mixed some more stuff into it and asked me to taste it again. And I dipped my finger in the marinade and I said, it tastes like really good soy sauce. <laughs> She had me taste it from her finger, and the taste was different. From my finger, the taste was plain, but from my mother's finger, it tasted full of flavor. I tasted the bitterness through the sweet marinade, the bitterness of her father who abandoned his family, of leaving her mother and sisters to join her husband's family, of marrying a man who was ambition-oriented, of having to leave her firstborn daughter in Korea while she moved to the United States to be with my father so that he could study, and of working many days and nights at the dry cleaners to support her family. The taste from my mother's fingertips is the key to Korean cooking. A cook's hands, more specifically their fingertips, they decide the flavor of the food. The Korean calls this soma which means the taste of one's hands. Korean dishes are made and mixed by hand, so soma is not just a cooking technique, it is a communal experience. Roy Choi, who started
started that Korean taco craze here in Los Angeles and runs one of the most successful food trucks, describes Songma as sitting around a table as a child and just having food shoved into his mouth like a conveyor belt. Songma is also very scientific. Different hands offer a particular flavor even when cooking the same dish. Rob Dunn, who studies bacteria in households, says that hands collect data from the daily experiences of life and record different stories of one person from another. So the bacteria and microbes found on hands determine the taste of the food. Making pugogi was more than passing down my mother's recipes to me. It was passing down all the bitterness from her soma, all the storytelling microbes that recorded her day. My mother told me the first steps in cooking is to start with a dish that you have eaten many times before and remember the taste. Become familiar with every flavor and then try to recreate that taste by using the same ingredients. And then as I recreate the dish from my own memory, I will create something of my own. And this is easier said than done because my mother's lived experience colored and flavored her food while my food remained tasteless from my numbed experience. And so even now, I'm still not comfortable cooking Korean food, but I have learned to eat it and memorize the taste. Learning to cook with Soma is doing what theologian Sia Song calls regaining the theological taste. That in churches, this happens at the Lord's Supper. Same bread, same cup. As the bread is torn and the tips of fingers dip into the cup, Participants leave their somat and their stories for others to taste. The table is where stories are shared and bread is broken from different hands. The table is where community is fed, nurtured, created, and established. And the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is vital to the Christian practice of community. It's a meal prepared by God, and it is a meal where all are invited. It is a meal where lives are set. Churches are usually known for their potluck casseroles. But how to move beyond the one-note flavor of baked starch and carbohydrates and move towards a global taste of flavors that is representative of the surrounding neighbors is the task of creating a theological taste. Some may be palatable and some may stretch our understanding of deliciousness. David Chang, a chef and restaurateur, calls comfort home cooking ugly delicious food. It's not meant to be served in a restaurant, it's not refined and it's not pretty, but it is what the body craves. Bodies crave a place that is nostalgic of home and a sense of belonging, and home cooking allows people to remember who they are and where they come from. Home cooking draws people out of exile. If you've ever seen the movie Ratatouille, Food critic Anton Ego has the power to destroy any restaurant establishment with just one negative review. And the future of the restaurant, Gusto, rests upon a positive review from Anton. So he served ratatouille, a French vegetable stew. Not a dish expected to be served in a fine dining establishment. But even though the ratatouille has undergone a refined makeover, the flavors send Anton back in time to his mother's kitchen. And what's more surprising is that the fingers that made this edible time machine are the soma of a rat. From the soma of a rat, a home-cooked dish was recreated by marrying the taste of the homeland with a new flair of the present. Anton says, there are times when a critic truly risks something, and that is in the discovery and defense of the new. The world is often unkind to new talent, new creation." the new needs friends. Last night I experienced something new, an extraordinary meal from a singularly unexpected source. To say that both the meal and its maker have challenged my preconceptions about fine cooking is a gross understatement. They have robbed me to my core. The church has been robbed to its core. As our country becomes more diverse, the Presbyterian Church still remains aging and mostly white. And we would be naive to believe that the changing needs of the church do not hit the core of our identity. That if the church is to be a community, 
then it requires both generations of Christendom and post-Christendom to recognize, acknowledge, identify, and see one another as vital and active participate, participants in creating God's community. This task also requires both to rearrange and reorder pre-existing assumptions, exceptions, obstacles, placeholders, and prejudices of the other in order to create space for creativity and change to thrive. And while it's important to acknowledge the loss many older Christians feel as they see the church changing, it is also important to those who remember the glory days to not hold on to the past too lightly, but instead create room for how the church can move forward. As a second-generation daughter of immigrants, it's important for me to remember the taste of my parents' bitter experience. It's equally important for my parents not to expect me to sustain and hold that bitter experience, but instead give room for me to re recreate our cultural heritage that holds both essence of the homeland and essence of the new land. Even though the church is doing ministry in a time much different than, the, than Christendom, the movement of change and readjusting the palette is not new. In the Reformed tradition, churches today follow Many leaders, such as Martin Luther and John Calvin and John Knox, who uprooted theological and religious institutions. At the core, at our DNA of the Presbyterian denomination, is the phrase, the church reformed always to be reformed, according to the word of God. So over the past century, the Presbyterian church has embodied this continual change process. The Union of the United Presbyterian Church USA, the Presbyterian Church US in 1983, the ordaining of women as elders since 1930 and as ministers since 1956. The ordaining of LGBTQ in 2010, the change of definition of marriage in 2014, and the addition of the Belmar Confession in 2016. And even this presbytery, and the presbytery that I reside in, has gone through many changes as churches have left and come. The Book of Order states that we are the balance adhering to the confessions of the church as well as the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So I end with this. As Presbyterians, being connectional is also in our DNA. Community and connectionality is not only a Presbyterian belief, but it is rooted in the Word of God. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. To love God is to love the neighbor. The neighbor gives the church clues on what needs to change and what needs to be upheld. The neighbor reminds the church that they are not to only serve themselves, but their community. Karl Barth says it is the neighbor who breaks through the egocentricity of the self by his or her own concrete existence and fellow humanity that demands my conduct to be such that the command of God is heard and obeyed. As a church, we need to keep tasting adjusting the seasonings, experimenting with new flavors in order to create something that marries the flavors of the great commandment, honors the memory of what was passed down, and has the ability to rock the church to its core. We need to live out the greatest commandment so that all lives that intersect really may experience transformation from loss to hope, from loneliness to community, and from exile to belonging. And when we do that, we will be living into the plans that God made towards a future filled with hope. No one will be in exile because we will have been taught by our neighbors on the margins how to live in community, how to taste each other's swimma, and how to be transformed 